What's up guys? Welcome to The Align Show. Uh, this is a visually demonstrative show about reinventing the pain management system that's leaving millions lost in chronic pain and the rest of us hurtling toward disease and joint replacements. It's about teaching you to be a wise steward of your body, teaching you how your joints work, live, and die, and how pain is born and lives exclusively in the nervous system. So we're just gonna break all that down for you. That's the, that's the major gist here. Um, so you are with Matthew Lister. I'm the founder of Align Pain Management, and this is Fabian Hernandez, the director of marketing here. Uh, so the rules of engagement. How's the show gonna go? We explain, break down, deep dive, and demonstrate concepts you need to know to understand your body, prevent joint replacements, heal chronic pain, and navigate the pain management system. That's the shtick. Yep, let's go. Cool, let's dive in. So, Caitlin, Caitlin is our story today. Mm -hmm. Aw, I love Caitlin's story. <laughs> it's so good. Cool. Let's, let's just start with like you meeting her, her coming in the, into the doors of the, of Align mm -hmm. and how, how did she hear about Align and then how did that all kick off? Yeah, I think, um, so some context, um, Caitlin was like 13 or 14 years old when she, when she came to us. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was actually, my first introduction was, um, was a phone call from her mom saying that she had a really challenging case that she was um, staring down double hip and double knee surgeries at 14 years old it's and crazy. that she was looking for any possible answer to help her escape that future. Um, and she said, so do you think you can help? And this is a phone call. I'm like, I've never seen this person. I've never talked to him. How, what was her tone like? Was she, I would imagine it's pretty intense. Was she? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I think she was, she's a determined mother who, I don't think desperate is the right, is the right tone, mm -hmm. um, but she wanted another life for her child other mm -hmm. than starting her off on a path of four surgeries in two years, like, it's yeah. just, just wanting to protect her from that. Um, and so over the phone, I'm like, I mean, I need to see her. <laughs> yeah. What is she um, dealing with? I need to see her. Yeah, I need hand. more info, but I mean, I, I would love to work on the case because it's such a unique circumstance, right? Uh, and so when, when she came in and I saw what she was dealing with, she just had such a, a biomechanical mess on her hands um, that I, I told her mom, I said, you know, I, I don't know if we can stabilize this, uh, but I would dang sure like to try. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't like this grandiose promise. It wasn't, uh, you know, machismo, like, oh yeah, we're the, it's like, let's see what we can get done because the alternative is not a good outcome. So what her pain points were when she came in was, uh, she, she had hip and knee pain, bilateral, both sides, hip and knee pain, low back pain. She couldn't go out for walks. She couldn't ride a bike. She couldn't go up and down the stairs in the house. Um, and she's, you know, going into high school, like wanting to live a normal life. Nice. Um, and so she, she was frustrated and sad and there's loss there around not being able to do these things and mm -hmm. that's a hard age to go through that type of pain journey since uh, she's so young like were you able to get down to like how she got to where she was i mean because like there are other clients where it's like they're older in age and so they you can kind of see where those patterns came from sure. but with someone culture who's leads young, to dysfunction leads to degeneration yeah yeah but with, with her it's not culture yeah <laughs> uh, yeah, so she had um, bilateral hip dysplasia. So she had instability in both her hips that her body responded to with um, this contracting of her lateral chain, her TFLs, her IT bands, and it just torqued her knees in and then pulled her lower leg, her tibia and fibia out. And so her feet were pointed out, her knees were turned in, and her pelvis was severely unstable. Is that something that I mean, you said the term, I already forgot it. Uh, 
hip dysplasia? Yeah, is that something that's common for people or is not it? Not real common. Oh, okay, cool. Um, not real common. Most cases that we see with that type of torsion through the knee and this kind of twisted mess um, are just cultural adaptations to a lack of movement variety. Gotcha. Uh, but for her, it was not that. It was instability through the, a congenital, natural, um, bony structure, uh, instability through the hips that led to this, this uh, unoptimal stabilization pattern that was just wrecking her. Okay. What was, what, what was her feeling like, like during your first evaluation with her? I mean, because it was in person, right? Yeah. Was it, yeah. yeah, it was in-house. Yeah. Um, she was, she's so cute. She's just like, you know, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to have surgery, sort of shy, reserved, um, you know, game to try anything, uh, but also, you know, uh, I think there was some, some hesitancy and some insecurity in that area of movement. And right. I mean, when, that's, that's an insecure age already. And then to throw like dysfunction and inability on top of that, that's so hard mm -hmm. emotionally. Um, I think that's one of the most impressive parts of Caitlin's story is just how amazing she was mentally. Um, really? Like her mental process was just so, was just so impressive. Um, like she, and we can all learn from that. It's, she came in clean slate and said, I, I want your help. I don't have conceptions. I don't have preconceptions or misconceptions. Um, I, I just want to walk with you through this and, and trust you and let me lead you, wow. right? Which is huge. Um, and then <laughs> she, she did the work. Yeah. I mean, for a 13, 14 year old to just show up and do the work is hard. I mean, her, her journey lasted, I mean, she was with us for years, but like her journey of like getting pain free was, uh, was fairly long. It was like probably 18 months. Okay. Um, and she was putting in the work three days a week, four days a week. Gotcha. Like it was awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there was a really memorable time when, from in my mind, when um, she, she kind of, uh, she kind of got a little bit relaxed and didn't do her program for, for you know, week, two weeks, you go on vacation and then it takes a week to get back in. And, um, and then she was hurting. And, and she's like, I don't understand why some people can go do whatever they want, never take care of their body and have no pain. And then me, if I take two weeks off, I end up hurting. That's a great question. Right, and, and I had to teach her that, that we're, all dealt, we're all dealt certain cards, mm -hmm. and we have to play the hands that we're dealt, okay? And so for her, she is prone to instability through the hips, and she is prone to general hypermobility. She's very, very flexible, so she's prone oh, to being too okay. mobile. And so she has to, she has to spend all of her time, not all of her time, but all of her time in training, getting stronger and tightening really critical muscles up in order to stabilize her structure. Whoa, okay. That would be cool to explain a little more because I don't know if, at least for me, speaking for myself, I don't know what other people know, but the hypermobility isn't always just a signal of like good health. Like you gotta balance it out sometimes. So, sir, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hypermobility is a condition <laughs> wow, okay. that needs to be battled against. And so some okay. people are genetically more predisposed to being more mobile. Mm -hmm. And then some people are more predisposed to being stronger genetically. Gotcha. So there's, okay. there's a little bit of a spectrum there. 
people can land. Mm -hmm. And so if you tend to be stronger and tighter, you have to spend more time consciously training mobility. Right. And if you are mobile. more mobile, you have to spend time consciously creating stability. And so everybody's dealt a hand of cards yeah. and we have to play them strategically and proactively to create balance in our musculoskeletal system. And so for her, she was so hypermobile that she has to work three, four times harder than anyone else her age just to get back to neutral, just to get back to normal, just to get back to functional. And she had a process of like grieving that and being angry about that, mm. which I think is super healthy. And then she accepted it and, and she almost, uh, she just, she took ownership of it. She took ownership of her body and she said, you know, I'm going to spend the time getting strong. I'm going to spend the time doing what I want to doing what I need to do so I can live the life that I want to live. And that's, I think, what's so powerful about Caitlin's story mm -hmm. um, is, is that stepping into stewardship and ownership of her body. And at such a young age, I mean, yeah. it's, it's awesome. She's, is, she's is she, super great. That's cool. Is she the, is she, was she one of the younger clients that you had? Kind One of, of the, the younger time. ones. I had yeah. a nine-year-old with real severe low back pain. Okay. Um, but she was definitely one of the one of the young ones for sure. Cool. Do you want to touch on? Um, I guess maybe just a few things program-wise that you maybe stood out to you while she was in the program that you felt like were turning moments or like because um, we don't. It would probably take forever to go through her whole program, but sure. like maybe some high-level stuff that was like, oh, okay, these were key turning points for her mm -hmm. for her while she was here she had one of the most dramatic feedback loops between her feet and her hips that i've about? ever seen what does that mean um, so everybody has a feedback loop between your 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 hips and your feet that either create better function or create more dysfunction okay okay so when a glute atrophies um let's go over to the to the Sweet. demo lab let's do it um when when a glute atrophies and then you go and walk and stand on one leg, um, your knee will buckle. Yep. Your knee will turn in. Okay. And that's because this muscle, your TFL is pulling through your IT band mm -hmm. and that pulls it tight. Well, what happens is that arch, see how my arch is oh, collapsing? Oh yeah, automatically. I got you. So the arch collapses automatically. Um, and so your hip issue can cause foot issues. Right. Okay. But if you have weak intrinsic stabilizers of your arch, okay. Yep. See how nice, strong arch there. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I have weak muscles in my arch and my arch collapses, then that will push my knee internal and that will create my hip issue. Okay. And so the feedback loop is hip issues can cause the foot collapse or the foot, foot collapse can cause the hip, the hip issue. Gotcha. And so most people, do you worry? Do you worry about the knee in the whole game, or is that like, or is it these two pieces that are your things you're focused on? Because the knee is going to follow suit. The knee follows suit. Gotcha. That's the that's the that's the dumb joint in between the smart joints. Right. Which I've heard you mention before. <laughs> yeah. The knee will go wherever it's told to go. Gotcha. So that's why you kind of call it that feedback loop because it's like that. Those are the you know main points of. Yep. And so for her, she had this really strong um, hip instability causing feet issues. Okay. And we were just like working on the hips, working on the hips, working on the hips. And, and then we were like, okay, it's slow. We're making progress, but it's slow. And I'm like, let's really start hammering feet hard. And then everything just went whoop right to where we wanted it. And everything stabilized, super clean. Um, but there was just a really powerful feedback loop between those two. And and a lot of people uh -huh. fixing one or the other, usually there's one major driver. Okay. Right, one primary and then maybe one that's kind of going along for the ride. For her, it was like two major levels of instability and we had to fix both because gotcha. you, she, we couldn't get her out of the chronic pain spiral without addressing both things at the same time in a really aggressive manner. Places. And she had so much torsion and twisting through her leg that her femur came in mm -hmm. 
Her femur was turned in, but her tibia was turned out, and then her foot was turned out even farther. Jeez. That's just a biomechanical nightmare yeah. to start to apply load to. So every time she would push, her knee would hurt, her hip would hurt, her back would hurt, her feet would hurt, everything would hurt. I mean, so yeah, look at it. Yeah, look at <laughs> like, of course it hurts. <laughs> so now that we can see how aggressive that how aggressively off that is what what were like some of the moves that you started her on how did she progress from yeah there? so at first it was all about getting her her T tfls, TFLs. Okay. okay because that was the muscle that was yanking her in okay okay so getting tfls released massage mobilize on a roller stretch it get massages whatever you got to do right mm -hmm. um then we had to release her hamstrings because her hamstring her lateral hamstring was really tight and um and that was causing a torsion in that lower leg as well and okay. then her calves were really really tight um particularly on the lateral side and so that was creating even more torsion force through that lower leg okay cool and so it's just releasing all those muscles that were holding that torsion pattern in place and then we had to go in and really consciously figure out how to turn on her TFL, her psoas, um, and then her ankle stabilizers, the intrinsic arches of her feet, that type of stuff. And so it was a lot of like static clamshells at first okay, yeah. where you're learning to fire this, static front leg raise lying down, yep. static front leg raise to get psoas turned on because she walked with this sort of sway and so there's no psoas work when you have an unstable gait pattern. She's swinging her leg through with her adductors rather than driving her leg through with her hip flexors. Oh, I see. That's interesting. Okay, and so her hip flexors end up getting atrophied. Pelvis gets even more unstable. And so we had to fix all that. Then it was getting her ankle stabilizers really strong. Um, and getting the um, intrinsic muscles of her arch turned on. So a lot of big toe splays, a lot of toe presses, banded toe presses, lots of balance beam walking, cool. lots of stuff where her feet had to physically curl, grip a surface, and turn on so that way her arches were nice and strong and they could fire so that they could hold the rest of her body up. Cool. Gotcha. And then we got her up to doing like full straight bar deadlifts with really? 150, 160, 180 pounds. Like she got strong. That's awesome. Full like 12 to 18 inch step ups with like 20 pound dumbbells. Like she got strong and was able to translate that force. When she was like making progress, I would imagine that that's pretty encouraging coming from where she came from. Mm -hmm. Like, do you remember when like, I mean, it's, it's kind of a slow process, so you probably is not like, oh my gosh, this is happening. But do you remember like her feeling like, oh my gosh, okay, I might have some hope here. I might be able to like, mm -hmm. I might see the light at the end of the tunnel. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it was just those lifestyle moments when she's oh, like, yeah. I got out for a hike with my family this weekend. Gotcha. And um, she can and, celebrate that. And, and she's like, and it didn't hurt. I'm like, that's cool. I love it. Yeah, I love it. And in the gym, you know, there's those big like, you get to deadlifts for the first time, you get your glutes firing in a clamshell. Like around here, like we go, glutes firing in a clamshell. <laughs> and then the whole gym is like, Woo! Exactly. let's go. Exactly. <laughs> and, the, and the person's like, I'm just laying here with my leg up. And I'm like, no, you're not just laying there with your leg up. Now your pelvis is gonna be stable while you walk. Yeah. Let's go, yeah. that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> and so, um, you know, there was a lot of like victories, like biomechanical victories, but the lifestyle ones are really the ones that hit people in their hearts. Yeah, because that's when it starts to add up. It's like all the work I'm doing in here starting to translate to my real life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then like deadlifts and step ups where you're like doing things where you're like, I never thought I'd be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for her, because she never thought of herself as like strong. Well, she's doing full sit-ups and planks and dynamic planks and bear crawls and you know deadlifts with her body weight like 
she's strong. She's That's doing right. athletic stuff. And so she's like, I never thought I'd be able to do this. She was staring down the barrel of double hip and double knee surgeries. And just to be clear. She did not have to have those surgeries. She didn't have to have those surgeries. Yeah. Which is like, I mean, we could talk about that for a minute too. It's like, think about those pads right next to each other, right? It's like one scenario. What is this? What is the scenario she went through, and what could have it looked like? I mean, not only the money, but like the emotional state. It could have affected her. I mean, her life could look different now. Yeah, I mean, once you start having surgeries and cutting through connective tissues, and I mean, once you start disrupting tissues, you get contraction and scar tissue around those incisions, and that just creates more adhesion and. And so those tight areas that were her problems become scar tissue rather than just connective tissue tight problems. And so inevitably, I think they would have just made it worse. Yeah. Long term, it would have just made it worse. She might have got some short term relief, um, but not fixing the underlying root problem and then creating more tissue damage uh, in the long term. Yeah. Joint pain is one <laughs> of the only as one of the few conditions that truly requires a whole person approach. Yes. Okay. Our medical system is very set up to be a specialist heavy system. Mm -hmm. uh, but joint pain is joint pain and chronic pain are, is the exception to that rule, which is why our medical system does such a poor job of successfully treating it. Um, right. Somebody who comes in with joint pain, they have a combination of, of central nervous system dysfunction, peripheral nervous system dysfunction, um, biomechanical dysfunction, immune system dysfunction, and so, and so you need someone who is a, who is a generalist mm -hmm. who can look at multiple systems and how they're interacting with each other, not a specialist. Because if you go to a specialist, they're going to look through the keyhole of their specialty. Right. And they can tell you what they see, right? The surgeons that she went to told her what they saw and gave her a possible solution, which they were capable of delivering, mm -hmm. but they're giving it with with their limited vision of not knowing what biomechanical dysfunction looks like, without knowing how a joint is actually supposed to move out in the real world when it's loaded. And that's a very limited perspective. Yeah. But, and they will, and admittedly, they go, well, movement isn't my, isn't my area of expertise. That's where it goes over to physical therapy. But they're making the recommendation to get surgery or not. And so you can't separate structure from function because those two things are one thing yeah just because they're just because they're separate in a from a business standpoint doesn't mean they are in, in the, the real body. world yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like whatever happens to this anywhere like affects everything, everything about me yeah yeah that's that's good okay um yeah, anything else about her story that maybe kind of jumped out we should touch on? Yeah, I think, I, I, I think the two to three big takeaways from Caitlin's story that yes. I think I want, um, I want the, the viewers to get is she was exactly like everybody else walking through a pain journey. There was so much uncertainty mm -hmm. around what the problem was, what's going to be the fix, should I try the 15 different things at my disposal. And she had tried PT, she had tried chiropractic, cool. she had tried massage, she had tried injections, she had tried, I mean, you could just keep going. Okay. She tried everything. Um, and so you're facing this huge level of uncertainty, right? Um, and she chose to act with wisdom and ownership of her body in the face of uncertainty rather than fear and victimhood, which who could have blamed her if she did, right? Yeah. Like 13 years old in this really terrible spot dealt this hard hand, but instead of going, 
I mean, she, most people blame, a lot of people blame their pain on genetics. Yeah. She actually had a legitimate case <laughs> against genetics, <laughs> which is very rare. Right, right, she right. actually had a legitimate case, but rather than go, oh, well, that's just, you the know, it is. that's just the way it is. She said, no, what can I do about it? That's so powerful. Yeah. That and is that so age, powerful. Yeah. That's cool. And so, I mean, I think it's just a credit to her. I think it's a credit to her heart. And I think it's a credit to her parents. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they demonstrated that, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's really powerful. Cool. Um, I, think, I think the other part of that, the other thing is she learned, she learned the cards that she was dealt mm -hmm. and she took and she learned how to play them well. Okay. Okay. So she was, she was dealt the hand of cards that she was going to be hyper mobile, mm -hmm. right? All the way to that far side of it. Um, but she played her hand well and said, okay, I'm going to have to spend three to four hours a week doing strength work to pull me back over to a healthy and balanced musculoskeletal system. Gotcha. Right. And so it's going to look different. You're going to get the, you're going to get the, the, um, the, 35 to 65 year old guys who are like strong mm -hmm. and but they they're so inflexible <laughs> right and so they'll all end up with knee replacements and and hip replacements and all the replacements because they'll destroy their joints from immobility and then you'll get on the other side the um the women who are hypermobile yeah. right and because they're hypermobile, stretching will feel good. So they'll tend to go to things like yoga and things that only yeah. further that, immo that hypermobility because that's what they're good at. And so right. we tend to work in areas of strength, not working to even out our weaknesses. Gotcha. And that's, and that's what you guys are paying attention to when you're on the floor, when you're bringing people in. It's not necessarily like or the balance, you're, you're trying to find the balance between the two. The North Star principle that we use is that a healthy, pain-free body is adequately, not hyper, mm. adequately mobile, stable, and strong with a healthy immune and nervous system. Cool. Okay, so you can't just have mobility and expect to be pain-free. Right. You can't just be strong and expect to be pain-free. You have to be mobile, stable, and strong with a healthy nervous system and immune system. That's so interesting. That's what taking that whole person approach looks like. Because when you take that approach, it forces you to look at your midbrain and parietal lobe. It forces you to look at your peripheral nervous system. It forces you to look at your immune system and your nutrition. It forces you to look at your joint range of motions. It forces you to look at your neuromuscular firing patterns. It forces you to look at your strength levels. Um, and realistically evaluate if they're measuring up to your lifestyle or not. Gotcha. Right? And so it, that North Star principle forces you to take a whole person approach. That's what's so powerful about it. After Caitlin kind of went through the whole program, did you get to have conversations with like her parents um, kind of after the fact? Just like... Yeah, know? we had like regular sit down chats about it. And um, uh, I think they were just really grateful and yeah. really... And, uh, and uh, really glad that she was on a different path. You know, you don't want to see, you don't want to see your 13, 14 year old daughter starting to have four surgeries in a year at that age. Like that just yeah. puts her on a whole nother trajectory. And so, uh, you know, I think they were just really grateful and really just profoundly like glad that she was on a different course. That's cool. Yeah. Do some Q&A. Let's do it. It would be easy to call this place, you know, a little bit of physical therapy, a little bit of personal training. I think sometimes it's hard to just like call it one thing because sure. it's, you know, it doesn't necessarily fit your typical bubble of like what to expect mm -hmm. when you're searching for like pain management. Mm -hmm. And so it'd be fun to just kind of get into like, you know, defining what it is, how it might be different from physical therapy, how it might be different from your typical gym, mm -hmm. and just kind of like get into it on, on that level. Yeah. Um, we are what pain management should be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hubris aside, I don't know how else to say uh, it. Uh -huh. um, uh, 
if you go to a pain management clinic, mm -hmm. so we are aligned pain management, right? If you go to a conventional pain management clinic, they have a few options for you. They can give you pain medications, they can give you cortisone injections, they can give you pain stimulators, nerve stimulators, they can give you radio frequency ablations, all ultimately aimed at quieting your fire alarm system, which is your pain. And so that is equivalent to you're in your house making dinner and a fire in the bedroom goes off and there is a fire alarm screaming in the house. And rather than getting water to put out the fire, you grab a pillow and try to muffle the fire alarm, but let the fire rage on. Right. It's madness. Yeah. It's mad. I mean, if you watch somebody do that, you'd be like, what are you doing? What are they doing? Yeah. That's silly. Yeah. Right? And so, and so you set that there. Then you have physical therapy, mm -hmm. which they have the education for it, but all most 90 plus percent of physical therapy is acquired through the gateway of health insurance. Yes. Which okay. is a huge thing. Which to is talk a about, huge right? problem. Yeah. Uh, and so health insurance will dictate will dictate treatment. Health insurance will dictate how long you can be treated. Um, it will dictate how many joints can be treated, what joint can be treated, and what treatments you're allowed to get. So let's, let's and how yeah. much time that physical therapist can spend with each patient. I didn't know it was time restrictive. Mm-hmm. And so physical therapists are forced to work with four to eight people at a time and only spend 15 to 20 minutes with each patient, like total. And so what ends up happening is they can't do all of that and run a financially viable practice. And so they have to hire physical therapy aides to then actually take people through their programs. And so you're not getting enough time with a the physical therapist. You're not getting, um, you're not getting all the joint treatments that you need. As you well know, if you have a back issue, you need hip, knee, ankle, arch, and toe work as well. Um, and you just can't get that. You can't do that because you can't bill insurance for that. And so while, and physical therapists know this, that's why there's thousands of them jumping out of this system because ethically they feel terrible about it. They right. feel like they're not making the impact that they want to make. And so, um, and so getting treatment through the gateway of the, health in, of the health insurance company almost guarantees failure. The pain management system needs to be reimagined in this country. It needs to be reimagined. And it needs a whole person approach being taken. And it needs physical therapists or very intelligent biomechanical experts, I don't care what you want to call them, um, to look at biomechanical patterns and address those musculoskeletal imbalances in, in chains. They need a whole person taken care of. They need, a whole person approach needs to take the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system into account. It needs to take nutrition and inflammation into account um, and look at root causes, not just treat acute symptoms. You know, how bad does something have to be for you to even get help and then go through that channel and even, you know what I mean? And even, I guess what I'm saying is like, do things gotta be terrible for you to get help? And then by that point, like, mm -hmm. is it too late? You know what I mean? As I'll, I'll speak to the system, but there are definitely variances in doctors. Okay. Um, because your general practitioner is largely the gateway to the Western medicine system. Okay. You go to your GP and you explain your symptoms and they basically have three options for you physical therapy, surgeon, or pain management doctor. Okay. okay. Those are the only tools at their disposal. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and so if, that, if, those aren't what you're, if those aren't what you need or what you're looking for, then there's no point in going to that pain man or to that general practitioner in the first place. Okay. So they are oftentimes, they are the gatekeepers to those services. Okay. Okay. Um, as a system, um, as a health insurance system, a problem isn't recognized as a problem until it is acute. Okay. What can we like? Yeah. Give an example of what that could be like. Yeah. Until it is, um, until it's a big problem, until there is um, acute inflammation, until there is acute pain, 
And so uh, problems, until there's acute symptoms, right? And so problems aren't addressed or focused on. Big toe dysfunction, pelvic dysfunction. Um, it's symptoms that are recognized as the problem. Okay. But pain isn't the problem. Pain is the alarm system that there is a problem. And so our system is set up to give us the fallacy that pain is the problem. Pain isn't the problem. Pain is the alarm system that there is a problem. But that problem has been there for a heck of a lot longer than you've been having pain. Right. That's for sure. And right. so the system is built around a late signal, not an early signal. Yes. And that might, that might take a while for us to kind of catch up to. The, the verbiage of determining the difference between the signal and the real problem. Because mm -hmm. most people think that the signal is the thing to focus on. But we're trying to like change people's minds about that altogether. Yep. And so a late signal is pain. Pain right. is always a late signal. By the right. time you have pain, you've had a problem for a long time. Right. Okay. And so an early signal would be like if insurance paid for everybody to get a biomechanical checkup once a year. Interesting. That would be an early signal because your physical therapist would go, oh man, your big toe has lost 30% of its motion in the past 12 months. We should, we should work on this. Wait, that's, a, that's an interesting <laughs> discussion because it's like... That was what an, that's what an early signal would look like, where we're actually looking at problems, not at symptoms. See, what's hard though is like, like you, could, you can kind of understand how people think, don't deal with it until it's like yelling at them, right? You know what I mean, signal-wise? Mm -hmm. But I think that's, that's what we're trying to like share with people through the show and even here we're at trying Align. to give them a choice. Yeah. We're trying to let them know that their problems started much earlier and that the fact that they have to get a joint replacement now which it's is not a, a surprise, really. It's it not a surprise. Yeah. We could have called that 10 years ago wow. or 15 years ago when we saw the torsion pattern or the knee collapse because it's just inevitable. It's just mathematics. And so we love working with people wait, wait, when they wait, have small on. problems yeah, yeah. rather than when they have what insurance defines as a problem, which is pain and degeneration. Yes. And I want to make sure when you say just just because... I'm learning your, your language, but like <laughs> when you say it's just mathematics, it's like the patterns, the dysfunctional patterns always lead to certain problems, mm -hmm. right? So it's like when you're saying it's just mathematics, you're saying, I know if this joint doesn't function this way, it will inevitably turn into like a problem you can foresee. So that's why. Yeah, when I say it's just mathematics, when joint dysfunction only matters because it creates highly focused and localized areas of load and stress. Right. And so the mathematics of it go from a small number of load and friction to yes. a high level of load and friction. Mm -hmm. The numbers actually calculate out differently. And so when you increase the load, friction, and stress in an area, it is only mathematically a certain amount of time before that area is going to break down. Right. It's just mathematics. Right. <laughs> math get, is math and it plays out the same every, every time. single time. <laughs> and, and I think, I think that's what's kind of cool about it because you're right. If you're able to, I don't even want to say catch it sooner, but like observe it sooner, that is essentially what you're giving an opportunity for people to kind of now see mm -hmm. about their bodies, you know what I mean? Yeah, and this isn't a conversation that is happening in our culture. And so mm -hmm. people in their 60s and 70s who are, who are now coming to us saying, I have a pain, but nothing has helped, and we're explaining this to them, they go, why didn't anyone ever tell me yeah. this? And they never had a choice to make, they never had the opportunity to make a different choice because that education was never given to them right right and so we want to give this to people earlier right so that they can make better decisions in their 20s 30s and 40s so that way they aren't dealing with the mess in their 50s 60s and 70s yes i mean i feel like um i could see how joint pain could feel like a surprise 
when it gets crazy. You know, it's like, how did this happen to me? You know, because we've heard that. I do, I do like, I'm an athletic person or, <laughs> I've been, you know, I squat this. I, and it's like, I lift this many bags of whatever. And it's like, I don't know, it, it's not a surprise. It's just a lack of knowledge and like knowing, knowing what your body needs to be balanced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a season of the journey that we call the death zone. Mm-hmm. And the death zone is when your joints aren't stable. Mm-hmm. Okay, When you have atrophied muscles or when you have muscles that are too tight. And in that journey, your joints are actively degenerating, but you're also put at an exponentially higher increase risk of acute injuries. A rotator cuff tear, um, a muscle tear, a strain, a fall, something like that. Mm-hmm. And so um, we, we always kind of smirk because we always hear it and we hear it just, it came out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's the phrase. It came out of nowhere. You see, you and, <laughs> and I kind of smile, and I'm like, in the back of my head, I'm like, no, that was a mathematical certainty. I'm telling <laughs> that you, that played you. out Everybody. exactly as it was supposed to. <laughs> it feels that way, I think, to most people. Like, where did this come from? Sure. But I think, I think the more we talk about it too through the show, and just you know the more just in just in general it's like it, it's not it's not coming out of surprise like you're it is predictable it's predictable and expected i think there is a misconception that a line is physical therapy Ooh, and a line really? is okay. definitely not physical therapy okay um physical therapy shines in acute circumstances meaning you have a surgery you get in a car accident um, uh, these are acute situations. Right, break your arm. Mm-hmm. Um, that is where physical therapy shines. Sometimes our clients will like have a surgery and they'll wanna come to us for physical therapy afterwards and we're like, no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> you need to go to physical therapy because that's what physical therapy does really well. Okay. They help you recover from acute trauma. Okay, okay. okay? But the minute that it goes from local acute trauma, one joint, to chronic, long-standing, greater than six, eight weeks, um, multi-joint problems, the effectiveness of physical therapy goes And not because the physical therapists aren't skilled, because they are handcuffed by the health insurance gateway. Gotcha. Yeah, and so. Um, Which is what the freedom of a line has. That's, that's the kind of the what makes us better in some circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, because we can work on the big toe, the ankle, the hip, the breathing mechanics, and we can spend the time to do all of those things and do them right and get the person all the way to deadlifts and lifting heavy things and carrying heavy things. Because ultimately, if you don't get all the way through to strength, if you don't get all the way through to um, strong enough to live your lifestyle, you will inevitably default back into compensation patterns. That is why people end up on the physical therapy hamster wheel. They do enough physical therapy to get sub-symptomatic, yes. to get their symptoms of feeling better, and then they're fixed, Right. not actually, right. okay? And then they go back to their lifestyle and they're not mobile enough for it, they're not stable enough for it, they're not strong enough for it, and then they end up hurting again. Yep. And then they get sub-symptomatic, go to live their lifestyle, bam. And so every six months, every year, they end up back in the hamster wheel. Mm-hmm. It's inevitable, predictable, it's just math. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, and I think, I think there is something to be, to just calling out the advantage of a lines version of being able to kind of look at the whole thing be able to, I even wrote that down, like, um, actually Jay Lee made this comment about, um, about us being able to be like guides from day one up to X amount of years, um, you know, of someone being here Mm -hmm. and how programs, and maybe you could speak to this too, like programs are designed to have them not take any shortcuts, but develop in progression, in, Mm -hmm. in sequence, like, you're not gonna make someone do some crazy move that they're not ready for. That's mm-hmm. just not 
really the aligned way. And um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to speak to that, but I feel like yeah. I think. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut. Oh, you that's off. perfect. Um, I think the. I think the biggest difference. I think the I think one of the biggest differences, and it goes to this like part like long term partnership. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest difference is, the one of the first things. So in our consults, one of the first things we do is we just listen. Yes. Right. We hear people's story. We're hearing what has been tried in the past. We're hearing how they think about their pain, how they feel about their pain, and we're hearing their mindset around their pain. Yes. Right. And then one of the first things we do in the console when we start talking is to start fixing their mindsets because that is always the first step. If the mindset doesn't change, the behaviors cannot change and flow from that. Right. Right. And so, um, and so one of the first mindsets that we install is long-term thinking. Okay. Okay. And so, uh, and when you go to, when you go to um, a lot of health practitioners, they're always, they force you into short-term thinking. Okay. Could okay. you provide like an, uh, uh, the way that looks? Yeah. So in real life. Uh, so my shoulder was hurting, so I went to my general practitioner, they sent me to the surgeon, and now my surgeon took an MRI, and, um, and uh, I, I need to get a rotator cuff repair, mm -hmm. okay? Um, uh, statistically speaking, your shoulder pain may or may not be coming from your rotator cuff tear. Mm -hmm. There is 65% of the population walking around with completely asymptomatic rotator cuff tears. So that tells you that those two things are not as tightly correlated as you might think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's set that aside for the moment. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, how do we think more long term? How do we go, okay, what, what movements do you want to be doing when you're 65, 75, 83? 85, mm -hmm. okay? Do you wanna be able to raise your arm up over your head? Do you wanna not have neck pain? Do you wanna not have shoulder replacements, okay? Because yes, that rotator cuff may have torn, but why did that rotator cuff tear? What in your shoulder mechanics led to that rotator cuff tear? So instead of just jumping into the middle of the story and going, oh look, you have a rotator cuff tear, let's fix it, and setting you free, we wanna go, where did this story begin and how do we want it to end? Let's not think in 60 day, 60 day terms, let's think in 30 year terms. Where do you wanna be when you are 65, 75? You wanna be pain free, that means you need to be mobile, stable and strong mm -hmm. with a healthy and regulated immune and nervous system. So fine, you may need to get that rotator cuff repair, but you need to fix the mechanics of the shoulder that created that rotator cuff tear in the first place. Because if you don't do that, that repair is just gonna get torn again. Yeah. And so you end up on this repeating surgery loop where it might not be the rotator cuff the next time, it might be a neck pain. It might be something else that is getting thrown off from this improper shoulder mechanic. Yeah. And so like, when, when you think about people who come up to a scenario like that, I mean, what advice would you give them then at that point? It's like, there's probably people right now who are like getting ready to maybe embark on a surgery. Mm -hmm. They come up to that, like that decision. And it's like, instead of just kind of jump into, you know, this, this problem that's Short yelling at term. me right now, mm -hmm. what should I do when I get there? Mm -hmm. um, why? Why is one of the most powerful questions you can ask in these types of situations. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, my knee needs to be replaced. Why? <laughs> what, how did it get that way? Yeah. What mechanics created that degenerative pattern? Why did that need to generate in the first place? And would you ask these questions to a doctor or to yourself? Sure, yeah, ask the doctor. So when you go into the doctor's office, you're bone on bone. Why is my knee bone on bone? Why did it degenerate How'd that it get way? There? How did it get that way? Right? And then uh, how do we prevent the other one from, how do, so how do we prevent this next knee that you're gonna give me from going bad? Even the replacement. 
yeah. yeah. I mean, if you don't fix the reason the first one was destroyed, you can put a new one in. <laughs> You're just gonna replace. Yeah. You're just gonna destroy that one too. Just swapping knees out. Yeah, you're just swapping knees out at that point. <laughs> or it might be the low back, or it might be the opposite hip, or it's it's it doesn't always land on that same joint. It's gonna be another joint somewhere in that chain. Right. Okay. And so when um, when we partner with someone, one of the first things we're doing is we're going, okay, how do we think long term? What do you want life to look like? in five years, 10 years, 15 years, that's how you get people thinking beyond the short-term situation and bringing them more wisdom, which is long-term thinking. I don't know if this is a problem, but in my mind, I could see it being a problem for me. Um, having the confidence to kind of stick up to yourself and ask those questions. Um, stick with, up to your doctors? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, I mean, for a lot of people when they're dealing with pain, you can feel like, oh, I don't know what the, the, the right answer is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not trying to dog on any, anyone or anything like that, but it's like, I think it's natural to kind of trust, you know, people who might know more than you. So it's like, what, you know, I guess what type of um, encouragement would you give someone about learning how to stand up for themselves in something like that? You know, is that just asking the right questions? Is it, um, you, know, you know, what types of tips do you give, I guess, yeah. someone? I think the key that? is knowing, uh, the first step is remembering that they aren't the be all end all of knowledge. Mm. They are a specialist mm -hmm. with a, they are a hammer mm -hmm. and they know how to hammer a nail. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to build a roof. They don't know, they are a tool, right? Right. They have a specialty, right? Okay. And so knowing that it's not their job to fix you. Okay. That's huge. Okay, let that settle in for a second. I know it. That's huge. Because most people go to their surgeon or their doctor and give them their pain rather than ask them for their opinion. And that's not just the doctor side. I mean, there's other... Yeah, physical therapists, general practitioners. That, that mentality of like, hey, you fix my problem. I mean, we need to pull people from That's that, right? not stewardship. Right. That is, I need you to fix me. And the, doc the, the doctor can't do that. They're a specialty. Right. And they can offer you their services. Right. They're a for-profit business. <laughs> they can offer you their services. Uh-huh. And then, but they aren't someone that you can go, do fix it. my pain. Everything. F yeah, full. Do full. it all. Yeah, do right? it all. You just can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so... That's the first thing that you have to get is you have to keep ownership of your problem, not give it all to them. Okay. Because then when they don't solve all your problems, that's when people leave the doctor's office and go, my doctor's an idiot yeah. and they just don't care and they're not helping at all. They're just blaming them for... It's blaming and they have to maintain ownership. Cool. Okay. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is knowing that when you ask your doctor questions, you go into it with them written down. Ooh, that's a good tip. Go like into that. your appointments with questions written down because you get in there you and just... your doctor is in their white lab coat. Sitting just they right. They got their Harvard diploma <laughs> on the wall and they're sitting there and they're slightly above you. And, and then they land the question, and then, what do you got for me? Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? And then you just freeze. No, I'm good. <laughs> and so that's the first thing. Walk in with your questions written down. Yes. That is critical. Cool. Okay. The second thing is expect some doctors are gonna light up, they're gonna smile, and they're gonna be they're gonna be really happy that you're asking questions. Interesting, cool, that's good to know. Other doctors, okay. <laughs> there's a, there's a side of this. Yeah. Yeah. Other doctors will get defensive and and get frustrated with you. Cool. But if you keep it cool, you ask good tone to your yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, you cool always communicate in a healthy way. Yeah. It's not accusatory. That's yeah. definitely not what we're recommending. No, it's good. Um, but regardless of how you ask, you're gonna get different responses. Cool. Good. To They're know. humans. They're imperfect. 
they might have not had food that day. They yeah. could be a little grout. I mean, sure. they're people, Good. just like the rest of us. Yeah. Um, and so just know that sometimes you might get a snarky answer because no like, that's cool they might feel yeah. defensive i think it's good to like set people up for understanding what they might expect for asking that question yeah. but you know being prepared for a scenario like that or just having i guess the know-how and the confidence to to stand up for yourself having yeah history, I think and good. i think it's i think i think it's really just maintaining ownership and stewardship remember they don't have to live with the joint that they're about to operate on. Oh my gosh, yes. They have, Good. They, their stats will reflect it, but they don't have to live with the joint that they are about to operate on for the rest of their life. Who does? The person who's like asking. Yeah, so you, you gotta go have to bat. live with this joint. And so you have to take ownership of it and, and get questions answered and know what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Um, Kind of a fun story. I don't know if we have time for it or not, but kind of a fun story. Um, I went to my pre-op appointment for my three-level spinal fusion. Uh And this is, went to the UCSF Spine Center, world-renowned, head of outcomes research, surgeon, Mm -hmm. at a teaching hospital, Harvard-educated, Tim and his nurse, and he walks in and he goes, all right. And I was friends with him, so that helps a little bit. Okay, okay. um, I fixed his back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay. um, so w- 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 he walks in and he goes, "Okay, Matthew. So we're gonna do a, um, we're gonna do a, uh, a three-level spinal fusion, and we're gonna go with a posterior approach where they cut through your back to get to your spine." Okay. And, and I said, I said, no we are not doing a posterior approach. I'm 22 years old. You're not gonna cut through my spinal erectors to get to my spine and disrupt that tissue. And then I'm gonna have scar tissue back there and I'm just gonna have a mess on my hands that I have to live with for the rest of my life. Yeah, what? I wanna do an anterior approach where they go through your abdomen, they cut and then they move muscle tissue out of the way rather than cut through muscle tissue. So they don't actually disrupt any tissues gotcha. or sever any tissues. Okay. And so it's a, it's a less invasive. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean like... they're taking your organs out and putting them on the table while they're doing it. But anyway, so the, the, the surgeon goes and he kind of listens and he goes, I'll be right back. And he walks out <laughs> of the room and it's quiet. And the yeah. nurse, the nurse goes, she pats me. I'm like, this is going to be good. She pats me. Oh, honey, he went to Harvard. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> if that uh, wasn't uh, punitive, yeah, and I just said, let you know. yeah, and I said, oh, honey, this is my body. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. Period. That'll work. Yeah. And he came in and he went, yeah, let's do an anterior approach. <laughs> oh, wow, what? If I hadn't have said anything, I would have walked out with a posterior approach. Wow. We forget that that, that these are just people. These are just humans. They might have a bad night's sleep. They might be, you know, they have a half million dollars in medical debt. They have, uh, they have problems with their spouses. They have child problems, just like the rest of us. Mm-hmm. And so they might be coming in and having a real rough day and they're just going on autopilot. Yeah, posterior approach. Mm-hmm. And they might need you to go, hey, let's think about this for a second. Yep. Because they're not perfect. Mm-mm. They're humans. Yep which is beautiful in all of its, its hard ways and beautiful ways. Right. Um, but we just can't give our problems to them and they don't want us to. Mm-mm. We have tons of surgeons that come here um, and I have a lot of friends who are surgeons and they, they know that good clinical outcomes come from when patients take ownership over their body. Wow. And they can't get good clinical outcomes without it because they know that they are such a small part of the grander equation. Wow. And they know that. That's interesting. So it's not like they're oblivious to it. It's just that us as consumers, us as patients are coming in and expecting them to fix everything. It's unrealistic. And then when they can't, and when they don't, because they can't, we get frustrated with them. And and give them a bad rap for something. Yes. And it was never their fault. They did what they needed to do. Right. 
That's so cool. Yeah. That's a good conversation. This next section is getting to know your joint. It's so crucial for people to understand how their joints live, work, and die. That You can't be a good steward of your body if you're oblivious to how your body works. Right. You just can't. You can't be a good steward of your money if you never look at your bank statement. Right. You just can't. Yeah, you need a reality check of like what's <laughs> going on. You need a reality check. <laughs> yeah. And so um, what we want to do with the Getting to Know Your Joint series is we want to introduce people to their joints, teach them how they're supposed to work, what dysfunction looks like, um, and what happens when they start to break down. The neck is a low load, high mobility design. See the muscles in my, in my neck? They're yep. small. Cool. Right? As compared to the muscles in my glutes, right, right, right. quads, these are big beefy muscles, right? Small bones, small muscles, means they're designed for small work. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Lots of individual pieces, which allow for a lot of mobility. Okay. So the neck is designed to rest on top of the shoulders. Okay. Okay. And basically just balance, rotate and stabilize the head on top of the shoulders. It is not designed to hold the weight of your head up at all times. When the head shifts forward, you are forced to hold up the weight of your head all the time. Gotcha. These neck muscles were never designed for that. Okay. okay? They are built and designed to turn on, turn off. Okay. Okay. Feel my neck. Let well, me do that side. Okay. Relaxed, right? You're not feeling tight contraction. Nope. Okay. Contraction. Feel it? Yep. No contraction. Yep. That's what these muscles are for. Turn on, turn off. Turn okay. on, turn off. That's, That's it. it. Okay. okay. <laughs> but when this area gets dysfunctional, our head comes forward, our scapula goes forward. These muscles become, instead of balancers and stabilizers, they become structural cables that we're forcing to hold our head up. Out of pure, just like... Out of pure geometry. Yeah. When that head comes out in front, now our neck muscles are holding our head up because if they didn't, right. we would just be looking at our feet all day. Gotcha. Okay. And so um, then when this scapula tilts forward, when we get this rounded shoulder position, mm -hmm. shoulder blade position, we lose scapula stability and all of the work of raising our arm and all of our arm movements come directly into the neck. Okay. Gotcha. And so we overload the neck. So let's go back to how is the neck supposed to work? Cool. Okay. The neck is a low load, high mobility area. So it should rest on top of the shoulders. Mm -hmm. These muscles should stay relaxed. It should bend laterally 60 degrees and it should rotate 90 degrees. Good. Okay. Yeah. That's what a healthy neck looks like. Okay. Okay. Everybody needs to know what a healthy neck is supposed to look like because <laughs> yeah. everybody owns one. Yeah. <laughs> we want to make you a good joint owner. <laughs> I feel like you should say that one more, the <laughs> metrics one more time. Like, like, just say it one more time. Sure. The head should stack on top of the shoulders. Right. Okay. That makes it so that these muscles aren't constantly holding your head up. Yes. Okay. So now it's just resting and balancing on your shoulders. Gotcha. Then your head should be mobile enough to bend sideways. That's called lateral flexion. Okay. Not that important. Okay. 60 degrees. 60 degrees. And it should be able to rotate 90 degrees. Okay. Okay. So they can, I mean, they can check that right now. Yep. Yeah. hundred percent. See, see how things are going on, mm -hmm. going on with your neck. Yep. Yep. That's how it's supposed to work right. in that state. Chronically tight traps, constant headaches and neck degeneration are not a thing. Oh, okay? that's what happens when things are over tight there. Correct. Oh, I didn't know that. So if so, people are having those problems, chronically tight traps, headaches and degenerative conditions of the neck are not an inescapable reality of life. They are a reality of poor biomechanics and poor maintenance of your neck. Okay. That's the takeaway there. Cool. Okay. Let's talk about the neck. Okay. The, we might be able to do this whole segment right here at this close up. Like this it, is man. nice. Yeah, I, like I like it. It's cool. So the neck is hugely dependent upon everything below it. 
Okay. Okay. So when you think about taking care of your neck, yeah. Okay. The neck is only healthy if your mid back is healthy, if your scapula is healthy, if your shoulders are healthy, because the <laughs> neck is completely and utterly dependent upon the thoracic spine, the scapula, all of the scapula stabilizers, and the shoulder. Problems wow. never start in the neck, they end in the neck. That is so weird because I don't want to go too far into the lower body, but it's like lower body, bottom up. And this is interesting that it's like top down kind of? It's not, it's still bottom up. It's, it's the head is resting on top of the shoulders. Oh, gotcha, yes, yes, okay? yes. And so when the same thing with the, with the hips and the low back, yep. when the hips get dysfunctional, the low back gets it's destroyed. Yep. When this area, when the scapula, the mid back, get dysfunctional, the neck gets destroyed. Wow. Joints are always dependent upon the joints above and below them. Right. Okay. And so the neck is dependent upon the joints below them. Cool. Okay. So when you have a neck problem, you never actually have a neck problem. You have a mid back problem. You have a scapula problem. You have a shoulder problem. No one has neck problems. <laughs> so if you think you have a neck problem, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. It's not a neck problem. You can have a lot of neck pain. That is caused by. That is caused by problems in the mid back, the scapula, and the shoulders. Okay. okay. Let's break that down a Let's little do bit. It, yeah. So, um, the shoulder blades. Yeah. Okay. The shoulder blades, your scapula, should sit in an upright position. Right. Okay. So they should sit upright, pointing how, up toward the sky. How is his? This guy. Um, you all right. He's okay. He's a little bit. He's a little bit tilted forward, but not a ton. But you want these points. I mean, perpendicular to per, yeah. We, I mean, vertically or zero to ten degrees is, is okay. fine. Okay. Um, so in that position, in an upright scapula, you have evenly distributed the load of carrying your own weight and all your shoulder movements across this entire region of stabilizers. Okay. Which includes the neck. Okay. Okay. Is there a muscle that's connected? So there's a muscle that's connected here to here somewhere? Yeah, your traps. Oh, that's what the trap does. Uh huh. Okay. So your traps insert here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, they kind of insert stuff. all the way down. But. Whoa, um, wait, wait, wait. It comes all the way over here? Mm hmm. Okay. All right. And so when, when muscles that. Sh when the serratus anterior muscle mm -hmm. under the shoulder blade gets weak more work is forced to be done at the traps. At the top. And so chronically tight muscles always have an origin in a chronically weak muscle. Don't chase chronically tight muscles, fix chronically weak muscles. So if you're going to fix that problem, you're going to pay attention to this weak muscle. Correct. This tight one. Because you can go and get a massage and stretch all day long, but until you actually until you actually address the root cause of why is this muscle overworked, it's never going to relax. That's so crazy. It has work to do. Which is, a, I mean, anytime I have tightness, it's like you're naturally going to want to be like, stretch it. Yeah. <laughs> stretch it. Massage. <laughs> foam roll. <it. laughs> but it's like, again, thinking about, uh, thinking about balance in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. If something is tender and telling you something, it's like, how did it get there? Mm -hmm. What, what, why? Yeah, the tightness is there, but what is maybe underdeveloped or not strong enough? Yeah, a really simple hack to change your mindset on that yeah, good. is instead of thinking of something as tight, think of it as overworked. Okay, help me. Okay. Okay. Overworked in the sense that the other muscles underworked. Correct. Gotcha. Because if that is overworked, what is underworked? Yes, something else. That's good. I like it. Okay. That's good. That's and good so you tip. go, why is so much work happening at this area? Okay. So the shoulder blade should be sitting upright. Mm -hmm. Okay. If the shoulder blade isn't sitting upright, you're going to trash the neck. Okay. okay. So in can, can you explain? Okay. So if it is, it, it, was that just what you were explaining as far as like, if it is um, angled too far forward, it, it's just putting too much pressure on those, mu on those muscles. It's, it's 
tightening them. More work is happening through the traps and levator scapula muscle than it should be. Got you. Because like if this, so if, I guess if this moves forward, it's putting more pressure. Yep, attachment point here and here. If this elevates and shifts forward, it's then it's, this muscle gets put in a shortened position. Gotcha, okay. And it's locked into a turned on position. And so you hear it all the time. Oh man, I, my neck is just always tight. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> No, your rotator cuff and your serratus anterior muscle are just always weak. <laughs> so how does it get there? How does it get, how does this get weak? Mm -hmm. I would imagine as this gets weak, this just kind of gets worse and worse and worse and worse, Correct. Right? It's culture, it's lifestyle. Okay, we so, spend our time here, okay. we spend our time here, we spend our time here, everything is protracted shoulders. Okay. And then we have high stress lifestyles, and so when we stress, we contract our traps, we contract our pecs, and so everything gets brought into this protection mechanism. I don't want you to sweep over that. So like <laughs> stuff that's going on, like, like stuff like stress, other things are affecting the way your posture is, the way your body is, naturally staying mm -hmm. so your midbrain mm -hmm. and your brainstem are what regulates posture <laughs> okay also areas of emotional regulation our emotions okay our our midbrain and our brainstem are what regulates posture they're also centers for emotional regulation right and so when we experience danger when we experience fear when we experience distrust we close ourselves up, we protect ourselves. Well, when you look biomechanically what we're doing, we're contracting our traps, we're contracting our pecs, we're shutting off our rotator cuff, we're shutting off our serratus anterior, we're protecting our vital organs. And so, yes, our lifestyles, our cell phones, our laptops, but also stress, um, hard relationships, hard conversations, these have biomechanical implications. And so, if they're causing, if they're causing what would be like a closing down of, of what is happening structurally, that means the reverse happens too, right? So, hundred percent. When you go in and out. when you go in and release those biomechanical patterns, you also reduce stress. There's a feedback loop between your biomechanics, your breathing, and your emotions. Breathing. Touch on the breathing part. What do you mean by that? I mean it's just. I mean you're breathing br better. Your breathing happens musculoskeletally as a muscle contraction. We don't, we don't think of it as a muscle <laughs> no, contraction, but it's a muscle contraction. Really? Your diaphragm is a muscle. And so when we don't feel safe, short breaths, short breaths, holding breaths, holding your breath, you start breathing through your neck rather than through your diaphragm. And that alters your, that puts you more into your sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight response and that changes the way you think, it changes the way you feel. So these muscles get atrophied for a whole host of reasons, lifestyle, emotions, our environment. What mechanically is this turning off? Because I don't, I don't know much about what muscle this is and what it's doing, mm. what, it's, what it's doing. Yep, so the muscle that we're talking about specifically is called the serratus anterior muscle. Okay. It inserts at these ribs and then sneaks under your shoulder blade mm -hmm. to the front side of your shoulder blade and the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. So when it contracts and carries tone, oh. it sinks that shoulder blade down into a healthy and position and stabilizes that shoulder blade. That makes sense. Okay. 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 So that shoulder blade should remain upright. Wait, so it's, if it's weak, <laughs> if it's weak, if it's weak and it goes this way, can it get, is it getting longer? Mm-hmm. Okay. Weak, a weak and long muscle? Mm-hmm. It's interesting kind of, you find that interesting. I, I, mean, I mean, weak and long, I don't know. I, I don't know why my mind thinks weak, tight, short. It can be both. Okay. It yeah. can be weak, tight, short. short muscles weak, are weak, often tight. weak muscles. But you can also have weak muscles that are just elongated. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. We're getting into technical stuff <laughs> yeah. now. I, I like it. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So in order to have 
a healthy neck, you have to have a healthy mid-back, scapula, and shoulder. Cool. Okay. At rest, the shoulder blade should remain upright. Mm -hmm. The mid-back has to have the ability to extend. The mid-back, the thoracic spine, okay, all these segments allow for motion into extension. In order for our arm to come overhead in a healthy way, mm -hmm. our mid-back has to come into an extension, 30 to 40 degrees. Your scapula has to rotate outward. Yes, okay. See my shoulder sure. blade rotating outward? Yep. Okay, that outward rotation gets this bone back up here, which allows room for this arm to come overhead. Yes. Because if that scapula doesn't rotate, look what happens. Your rotator cuff lives in here. Yes. Okay, and so then it just pinches. Boop. Pinch. And that's where you get the lack of range of motion because it's like, it's not lined up in order to, to connect or to fully. You'll have a bony restriction because this bone will literally run into this bone. Gotcha. And so you physically can't raise your arm up any higher. And what you do to fake that range of motion is elevate your shoulder Shrug. and use your neck. Gotcha. Okay. So in order to have a healthy neck, you have to have a scapula that rests upright, a thoracic spine that can come into extension, a scapula that will rotate when you ask it to. Cool and an arm that can go over your head without your neck dominating that movement. Right. That's your checklist. Cool. Okay, when this is functional, this gets saved. When this is functional, load doesn't get shoved here. Okay. That's crazy, yeah. I like it. So, what happens when you leave dysfunction around for a while? Okay, what does dysfunction look like? It looks like, that scapula sitting at an anterior tilt. It looks like this mid-back getting stuck in this sort of kyphotic position. Um, your arm not being able to go overhead. Right. Your neck not being able to turn, right? These are all dysfunctions, okay? What happens when you leave, your, leave those things around for a while? Well, you create more focused stress and strain on the structures of the neck. Okay. Okay. And then those structures degenerate from the overstress. Let's talk about that. Okay. So the, some of the most common degenerative patterns in the neck are degenerative disc disease. Okay. Your discs are these little pillow cushions between your vertebrae. Yes. Okay. Those will get ground down and you will end up bone on bone. Okay. I didn't know that could happen in the neck. Mm -hmm. I guess any disc. Any disc can, can go. do that. <laughs> yep. Um, the, there's a gap where your spinal cord runs through. Mm -hmm. Okay. That can, uh, the bones will grow in around your spinal cord. That's called a stenosis. Okay. Okay. These are all load patterns. When you load bone, it grows thicker. Okay. Okay. So when you leave the neck loaded, you will get degenerative disc disease. You will get a stenosis. You will get bone spurs because when you load a bone, it grows thicker. You will get chronically tight traps. There's all sorts of degenerative patterns that will be created if you leave these, if you leave this dysfunction around for a while. Gotcha. Okay. So how do we fix it? Yes. How do we fix that? Let's talk about Let's that. Let's do it or our biomechanical dysfunction is always a combination of certain muscles that are too tight, mm -hmm. muscles that are locking you in this forward position, muscles that are locking you in this elevated position, mm -hmm. okay? Paired with muscles that are too weak or atrophied. Gotcha. Okay, so step one, we need to mobilize, release, lengthen these tight muscles. Yeah, what does that look like? Okay, so the, the, the big ones to start with are pecs and traps. Okay. Okay, so let's just take you into a simple active pec stretch. Let's do it. Okay, so put um, hand up on the wall. Yep. And then shoulder scooped. Here, come on this side. Hand up on the wall. Yep, shoulder scooped and you're just going to turn away from your hand until you feel a nice stretch through your pec, through your shoulder, through your bicep. I just felt a little pop. <laughs> That's okay. Pop. Okay, so exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, 
exhale as you go into the stretch. So when you exhale, you're asking for range of motion. You're asking your nervous system to release and relax that muscle. So that's one way of lots of ways to cool. open up the pecs. How many reps do you usually recommend someone doing this? 10 to 20 reps, couple sets, two sets. Cool. Okay. Next, let's go into an active trap stretch. Cool. Okay, so hand goes toward the floor. Mm -hmm. Other hand comes to the side of the head and you're just going to exhale as you side bend that neck. Don't pull on it, you don't wanna create pain. You wanna ask for range of motion. Okay, and now you should feel a nice gentle stretch through the neck, okay? And now we'll take this active as well. So inhale, exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Ten to twenty reps, two sets. So at this point, we've released the pec, we've released the traps. Those are the two muscles that are locking the shoulder in that problematic position. Now we need to turn on and fire the rotator cuff and that serratus anterior muscle. Yeah, I'm so curious. <laughs> I, I've never paid attention to that interior mm -hmm. serratus. Yep, so let's start by turning on that rotator cuff. Cool. Classic sideline external rotator. Good, and now you can support your head. Like? With your hand. Like yep. This. And now we're gonna pull the elbow there. We're gonna scoop that shoulder blade down and back. Yep. Okay, and now we're just gonna open and close. Open, close. This is a sideline external rotator, okay? okay? So you wanna keep that elbow pressed into your side, and now you wanna fire this muscle right on the back side of the shoulder. You don't wanna feel your delts. You don't wanna feel your bicep doing the work. Okay, open and squeeze. You wanna feel that muscle working. That's wow. the atrophied muscle that you need to get working. <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, it's already like kind of sore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of. You seem like you got some more work to do before you can access this. This yeah. muscle's working hard. This oh, muscle's really? working hard. You're not really getting your rotator cuff wow. firing overly strong. It's getting there. Okay. So if you did three sets of 30 with just body weight, don't even go to adding weight. So you do add weight eventually? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we build people up to three sets of 30 with three to five to eight pounds. Yeah. Okay. Then um, let's work on that serratus anterior yeah, muscle, which anchors that shoulder blade up. Okay. Okay. Let's go on to all fours. Cool. <laughs> this one's going to be hard. <laughs> so watch me for just a second. Okay. You're going to go into a, what's called a scapula push up. Here, come right here. Yep. Okay. So shoulders are down away from your ears. You're letting your shoulder blades drop back and then you're pushing away from you. Okay. Drop back, push, drop okay. back, push. Okay. Okay. And, and you want to feel that serratus anterior right in your armpit firing. Okay. okay. You might have to show me where I'm, where it's supposed to feel the fire. Yep. Shoulders down and now, re yep, retract and now push, separate your shoulder blades. Good. And you want to feel it firing right in there. Really? Okay. Retract, push. Good. Keep those shoulders down. Don't use your neck to do it. Yeah. <laughs> retract, push. Good. Shoulders down, push through here, push through here. Interesting. Down, down, down. Yep. You're literally retraining what muscles are firing. Yeah, no, I can, I'm, it feels very awkward. Uh-huh. That is the nature of getting atrophied muscles to work. Good. So you want to focus on firing that muscle right in there. And it's firing. You're getting it. So three sets of 30. And you will have evened out a, quite a few of those muscular imbalances. Wow. You know, it's funny. The whole, when you said it feeling awkward is like a sign of <laughs> reach. I mean, we sh you should kind of elaborate on that a little bit. Like, is that a pretty common mm -hmm. feeling, feeling, for feeling for people? That is, that feeling of awkwardness yep. happens 100% of the time. Yeah, so like if we have muscles we're not using, it's gonna, it's gonna feel strange to like search for it to, to fire. Cause that's essentially what I'm doing. Like in the move, I'm like, 
where is it? Correct. <laughs> okay, <Na> there it is. A hundred percent. The nature of atrophied muscles and getting them to fire is that you have to find them and, re wow. con and reconnect them to your brain. Yeah. And so you're We're searching for a muscle you're again. You're searching for a muscle <laughs> again, and it's a weird, uncomfortable, goofy it feels really thing, yeah. goofy and uncoordinated. Yeah. That's what we're doing. That's the way through. That's the way we're doing it, yeah. <laughs> so when you get this released, the shoulders come back. When you get these released, the shoulders come down. You get this firing, that pulls the shoulder blades up. You get the rotator cuff firing, that pulls the arms back. Now the head sits on top of the shoulders. You've taken the pressure off the traps and the shoulders are doing what the shoulders are supposed to do. Wow. Now that you broke down kind of like what it would take to maintain a healthy neck with all of the pieces kind of rolling together is there like is there like a like a routine that could like that people can try just to kind of even at home just to get it you know just to start kind of neutralizing their neck maybe that's some the problem they have is there kind of a, a program that you could give to someone to try at home or is that something you feel like we need to kind of help you through like a line would have to help you through yeah i mean there's definitely a starting point. Okay. Um, I mean, starting with static back where you're just getting on the floor and taking pressure off of these areas um, is gonna help to deactivate and relax some of these muscles. Gotcha. Um, but uh, I think the starting point is active stretches. The same, I mean, honestly, we yeah. just showed you. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's it. Can we, do you think if we gave like people kind of an outline just like of that in the description of the video. Sure, and we could even could link our YouTube exercise videos because we have exercise videos for all those. Cool. So we could even do a four part or four exercise awesome. mini series. Cool. That is getting to know your joints, <laughs> episode one of the next. I love it, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're just starting this journey and are super grateful for any feedback, comments, likes, shares. Yeah. Um, we we want to know what you want to see. We want to know what your questions are. Uh, we have an idea of the information that you need, but mm -hmm. we want to meet you where you're at and get your questions answered. Uh, so leave them in the comments. Um, you know, call us, email us, let us know, send us a message via carrier pigeon, whatever we need to do. Uh, get your questions in. We'll answer them. We want to know what you uh, what you want to know. We want to answer your questions. Uh, so yeah, thanks for coming and we'll see you next time.